Welcome to another episode of Mike's Money Picks. Today on the podcast, we're going to be breaking down the 2024 Rocket Mortgage Classic taking place this week at Detroit Golf Club. This is one of the more unremarkable venues that the PGA Tour sees year in and year out. And we're going to break down how that's going to affect the tournament this week and who you need to be looking at targeting, whether you are playing DFS, betting, one and done, or any other format of game this week. We're going to tell you who you need to be looking at when the PGA Tour heads to Detroit. This is our all-in-one preview. So we're going to break down the course itself, the, the stats and characteristics about this course that matter, um, and then take a look at the board and see if we can identify what you need to be doing in DFS betting one done in any other game format that you might be looking at this week. This is your one-stop shop for all of that information. Now, while you're here, if you like what we do for the PGA Tour, you're going to really like what we do for other sports as well. Um, we have some live best ball drafts that are up on the YouTube channel as well as in the audio feed. Um, so check that out if you have not already. But if you're just here for golf, go ahead and hit that subscribe button on YouTube as well as on the audio feed. That way you can be with us for the rest of the PGA Tour season as well as the rest of the live golf events throughout the summer because I'll be breaking those down as well. But pretty much if you if you like what we do here at golf, you're going to like what we do for the other sports as well. So, so give that a shot. Um, I promise you guys won't be disappointed. And once we get into the regular seasons, we're going to have a ton of college football and NFL and then college basketball content coming your way. In addition to the regular scheduled golf content also. Now, uh, the Travelers Championship last week was a pretty good week for us. I got to say, um, you know, I did have Tom Kim, Akshay Bhatia, and Tony Finau in my core. Um, so I had a ton of them, which helped me out a ton. The only error that I made was I did have a lot more Ludwig Oberg in my DFS lineups than Scotty Scheffler. That was kind of my big mistake. Um, and so because of that, I wasn't able to cash in on a big payday. But because I was super accurate with my core, I was able to have a profitable week playing DFS at the Travelers. And in terms of betting, I did have a ticket on Tom Kim at 40 to one. I was out on the golf course Sunday afternoon. And so I had seen notification get to my phone that um, Scotty Scheffler and Tom Kim were going to a playoff and I immediately cashed it out. Yeah, I, I know. I like as a math guy, I know that cashing out is the minus EV move. I know that that is not the optimal decision. I know that, you know, it's going to end up hurting you in the long run if you cash out all your bets like that. But I was so terrified of Scotty Scheffler that I just didn't have any faith that Tom Kim was going to win that tournament. I would rather take, um, you know, essentially half profit um, to just go ahead and be done with it as opposed to weighing it out and seeing myself win zero. So I did make the right call there. Um, if I had time to do the math, I probably could have set up a hedge that would have been better than my cash out, but uh, do definitely do not regret that decision in a pinch. Um, just thanks to getting a notification on my phone um, because I was out at the golf course. Now let's go ahead and um, kind of end the, the traveler's recap there. We're going to go ahead and dive into the rocket more classic and this is a fun one for me y'all because this is actually the first tournament that i will have covered three times this was the very first tournament that we covered back when we started the podcast back in august 22 um 2022 that is um and you know pretty much we were just doing audio back then we were we were real primitive we were doing really short episodes that didn't really do a whole lot of deep dives um and so it's been really interesting to kind of go back and look at my old notes from on the previous two years and see how i did those and, and what we ended up with and, and so um, really kind of cool to, to get to this tournament three times. And, and there's going to be some more ones coming up on the schedule that we're going to get it three times as well. So, um, yeah, as, as that sample size keeps growing, hopefully we just kind of keep getting more information and, and more accurate, more dialed in as we do these tournaments. Anyway, we're going to go ahead and end it for the introduction there. Reminder, if you're not already, please subscribe on YouTube as well as the audio feed. And while you're watching on YouTube, please hit the like button. It helps me out a ton. And if you're listening on audio, please rate and review the podcast. I promise those do not fall on deaf ears. Those help me out a ton. All right, let's go ahead and dive into Detroit. All right, so Detroit Golf Club. Um, as I mentioned in the intro, it is one of the more unremarkable venues that the PGA Tour goes to. Um, you know, I kind of ripped Live Nashville's host course last week, and, and this is would be a course that I think is kind of on par with that one, whereas I don't think this course is necessarily suited to hosting a premium golf tour event year in and year out on the PGA Tour. I just um, – it, it's not – it's just not really a special course. Um, now, I do think that it is cool that the PGA Tour has a um, tournament in the Detroit area. There's a rich 
golf history in the state of Michigan. A lot of great golf courses in the state of Michigan. This one was one of them, but it's just kind of not been able to stand the test of time. I think, um, you know, if the golf ball rollback actually happens a few years from now, this would be a course that I think would play a lot better after the golf ball is rolled back because right now with modern technology, it just has no defense. This is going to be an absolute birdie fest this week. And, and also my, my, my grandma actually lives in um, about an hour north of Detroit. So I'm decently familiar with the area. Um, I know where this golf course is and it is pretty nice course um, in general. I would love to play it like just for me, but, but I don't think that it is necessarily the greatest PGA tour course. Anyway, let's go ahead and dive in. So Detroit golf club was created around 1899. Donald Ross completed the designs of the courses in the early 1900s. So these courses have been around quite a while. Um, there were two courses built on the property, full 36 holes by Donald Ross. Um, so this week is going to be played as a composite course, as it has been for each of the last five years. Um, I believe that only two of the holes on the North course are, are used and the rest of it is just from the south course if i'm not mistaken um, i might have those backwards but i know that most of them are one course as opposed to the other now this event has been hosted at detroit golf club since 2019 there have been five iterations of it already this will be the sixth um, and all of them have kind of featured pretty similar characteristics this course is a par 72 it is a little over 7300 yards but it plays much shorter than that like when you think about courses like um, LACC last year, where LACC had the one really reachable par five, and then they also had the one really short par three. LACC played a lot longer on um, in actuality than it did on the scorecard because those two holes kind of brought the, the yardage total down, right? Riviera has a, a little bit of this characteristic where it has the really easy par five and then really short par threes, and so the yardage kind of gets shrinked, and so it plays longer than it does on the scorecard, right? Detroit Golf Club is the opposite of that. Like, the par threes here are quite long. One of the par fives is quite long. Um, and so all of the par fours are pretty short, pretty simple. Like it really does play shorter than that 7,300 yards that you're going to see on the scorecard. This is actually the flattest course on the PGA Tour. The lack of elevation change also makes it play a little bit shorter than it does on the scorecard. This is annually one of the easiest courses that is on the PGA Tour. There are four par fives at this course. And it, with it being a par 72, that creates optimal scoring conditions for PGA pros. Only one par five is not reachable for, in two shots for the entire field. So a lot of scoring is going to be done on those par fives. Now, as I kind of already mentioned, this is a very easy group of par fours on this course. They're mostly going to be driver and then short iron into green or driver and wedge into green. There's just not a whole lot of challenge in the par fours on this golf course. And so that's really kind of where you see, you know, easy scoring conditions end up. Courses that have hard par fours play a lot harder than courses with easy par fours, right? The fairways are about average width. But there's not a whole lot of penalty off the tee. The trees, are, you know, this is a tree-lined parkland golf course, but they're not super duper dense. You, you can very easily kind of punch out. You might be able to even hit a normal shot if you can really shape the ball, um, even if you do get caught in a little bit of tree trouble. Um, and, and the rough is not super penal as well. This is not like your U.S. Open thick rough or, or not even really even what we saw last week at the Travelers. Um, and so really just there's not a whole lot of – anything really to discourage guys from just wailing with driver off the tee. There's plenty of room to keep the ball in play. Worst case scenario, you deal with tree troubles and you're still able to advance the ball quite a bit. The greens are quite small at this course also, but they are open in the front. And they're also perched back to front, which makes them really easy to hit annually. There's a very high green regulation percentage here at this course. Reason being, if they're open in the front, then if you do end up in tree trouble, you can run the ball um, up on the green. And then if they're perched back to front, that means that it's really easy to stop the ball on the green because there's going to be less rollout because the ball will be rolling up a hill. So that just creates an environment where a lot of guys are able to hit greens, even though the greens are small. Part of that is also because of the fact that this is not a course that plays very long. So you're hitting short irons and wedges into these greens that are pretty receptive. There's just going to be a whole lot of greens hit here at this course. The greens themselves are bent grass with a POA mix. If you are looking at any kind of statistical database, um, the one we're going to look at, the rabbit hole, does have the bent POA mix as an option. But if your database does not, a lot of them do not, that's totally okay. You can just look at bent grass. There's not a whole lot of um, 
dissimilarities between regular bent grass and what a bent poet mix plays like. This is the same type of green style that we saw last week at the Trappers Championship, as well as the RBC Canadian Open um, a few weeks ago. So you can look at putting stats from that if you are so inclined to do so. Now, with this being a Donald Ross course, Donald Ross does love to give a lot of character to his greens. So there's a lot of undulation. This is a pretty difficult putting course. You're going to see a lot of short putts missed here because there's a decent amount of undulation. They're not the easiest greens in the world to read. Um, so this is actually a decently tough course to put on, but that's like the only aspect of the course that is more difficult than any other course on the PGA Tour. Like in all honesty, as flat as it is, as kind of nondescript as all the par fours are, it's kind of like if somebody just had a big old driving range, planted 18 flags, put up a few trees, and just said half at it. Like, there's just not a whole lot going on here. Like, it's just a lot of very straight par fours with a little bit of trees lining them, not really a whole lot of hazards, and it just plays super duper easy because of that, right? And when you look at the winners here, the group of winners here speak to kind of how easy the course plays and how you can kind of have different pathways to victory. The inaugural event, Nate Lashley won on Monday. I'm sorry, he won the event as a Monday qualifier. I should have worded that better. He was not able to be bet at most sports books. He was not in the DraftKings player pool when he won the event, which is crazy. Um, Bryson DeChambeau, Cam Davis, and Tony Finau won the next three iterations of it, and those are guys who are super long hitters off the tee, and Ricky Fowler won last year. So you have you know your three bombers that have won it, as well as a guy in Ricky Fowler who is considered one of the better putters on the PGA Tour, and then a guy in Nate Lashley who is considered a good wedge player and can get super hot with his irons and his putter on the PGA Tour. So what that means is there is multiple paths to victory this week. Distance is certainly an advantage. Like you see with the winners, Bryson DeChambeau, Cam Davis, Tony Finau, they're long hitters off the tee. They were able to take out a lot of the fairway bunkers because they were just able to drive it past them. We're kind of just able to take them out of play and make them not a factor. And also, this course does get easier if you're hitting wedges into greens as opposed to irons. And Distance would be your way to be able to do that, right? Now, a hot putter will also help you out a ton this week because pretty much if everybody's going to be hitting greens, it's going to come down to who can hit the most putts that's going to win it. Now, granted, you can give yourself a big-time advantage by giving yourself closer putts than everyone else is doing with. So this week is going to be a week where we are going to heavily prioritize um, approach play and putting because if you are able to put the ball super duper close to the hole, you're going to give yourself enough chances that you're going to be able to win this golf tournament and make yourself enough putts to win. All right. Now, in terms of the key stats this week, um, oh boy, somehow the slide got deleted from my PowerPoint. So let me go ahead and add one now. So in terms of the key stats this week, let's let me get, make a new slide here for Detroit Golf Club. So this is a pretty simple and straightforward week in my personal opinion. Um, so the key stats we're going to be looking at, strokes gain approach is always going to be um, something that we are going to look at because that is the most predictive general stat on the PGA Tour. But after that, we are going to look at driving distance because, like I said, I do think that gives an advantage. Um, and then we are going to look at opportunities gained. So an opportunity on the PGA Tour is described as when you have a 15-foot birdie putt or less. Um, and so opportunities gained, meaning how can you give yourself um, more opportunities than the rest of the field? Um, that would be what that would look at. Birdie or better gain, similar concept. Are you able to score a lot of birdies? Um, and then I'm also going to look at putting on this surface as well as performance on the comp courses, a.k.a. the other easy courses on the PGA Tour. And so my comp courses this week, like I said, pretty much easy courses, right? So when you think of birdie fests on the PGA Tour, especially bent grass birdie fests, you have TPC Craig Ranch, you have TPC Twin Cities, um, you have TPC Deer Run. I would even include last week TPC River Highlands. Um, I would also include um, Vedanta Vallarta, home of the Mexico Open. Um, Tony Finau has won both at this course and at Vedanta Vallarta. I would also include Sedgefield because it is another easy course that is designed by Donald Ross, even though the agronomy is slightly different. Um, and then TBC Twin Cities, I did mention it, but Bryson DeChambeau um, and Matt Wolf actually finished 1-2 in both of those events back in 2020. Um, so their performance at both those courses, as well as Tony Finau winning at both courses back-to-back, -back, is a pretty good indicator that is another solid comp course. All right, so that does it for the key stats for Detroit Golf Club. So let's go ahead and take a quick breather, and then we are going to take a look at the rabbit hole. 
All right, so if you have been with us for the duration of the PGA Tour season, you know the one I mentioned, the rabbit hole. I'm referring to the tool from Bet Spurts Golf known as the rabbit hole, which has um, just a ton of different filters and conditions that you can apply to really get in the weeds and get specific on stats. And it allows you to make a custom model so that way you can really kind of pick and choose um, what you want to identify in terms of the golfers that you are looking for every single week. So this week was actually a pretty simple week on the rabbit hole, in my opinion. Um, I always use a baseline of strokes gain total from the calendar year and then a baseline of strokes gained approach from the calendar year. Um, so in terms of the best golfers in the field in strokes gained approach, those are Aaron Rye, Keith Mitchell, Tom Kim, Lonto Griffin, Patton Kazire, Daniel Berger, Kevin Yu, Kelly Kraft, Grayson Sig, and Lee Hodges. Um, I'm sorry, that was last 24 rounds, not the entire year. So um, did get a little bit more specific there. Now, I also want to look at performance on easy golf courses because with this being an easy course, um, this is pretty much, you know, going to be, in my opinion, one of the key stats this week. The top 10 in this category is Eric Cole, who, as dreadful as he's been this year, has been pretty solid on easy golf courses. Followed by Steven Yeager, who is the guy I thought was going to be number one in this stat. Like, it's almost becoming... I wish somebody had like a growing list of everything I've used this metaphor for, for all of the sports that I cover, but like, it almost seems like death taxes and ploy Steven Yeager, easy golf courses, because he tends to always play well, easy golf courses. Third is Chris Kirk, followed by Brendan Todd, Ben Griffin, Alex Noren, Ben Coles, Keith Mitchell, Bo Hostler, and Nick Dunlap. Also wanted to look at driving distance. This, you know, as we mentioned, that is a pretty solid advantage here at this course. Um, and so the top 10 in that category this week are Cam Champ, Kevin Doherty, Alejandro Toasty, Luke Clanton, and Neil Shipley, who are both amateurs, Minwoo Lee, Jonathan Vegas, Keith Mitchell, Vincent Norman, and Ryan Fox. Now, I also wanted to look at strokes gained off the tee at driver heavy courses, and what you're going to see is there's a lot of overlap with that list that we just had, with the top five being Champ, Lee, Doherty, Mitchell, and Young. And then also strokes gained off the tee with a low missed fairway penalty, because there is a very low missed fairway penalty for this course. And again, there's a lot of overlap. The top five is Champ, Doherty, Mitchell, Norman, and Thompson. Now, this course is about more than just off the tee play, though. So um, what if we kind of narrow down golfers approach play to courses where there's a lot of greens that get hit? And so um, the best in the field in that category are Chris Kirk, Alex Smalley, Sam Ryder, Eric Cole, Ches Reeby, Jorge Campillo, Ben Coles, Adam Spenson, Justin Lauer, and Ricky Fowler. And then what if we make it strokes gain in easy conditions? Well, the list is going to be pretty similar. Alex Smalley, Chris Kirk, Eric Cole, Sam Ryder, the same top four, Grayson Sig, Justin Lauer, Adam Spenson, Tom Kim, Jorge Campillo, and JJ Spawn is your top 10 there. Now, I also want to look at strokes gain putting with the bent polo green and also wanted to compare that to their baseline. Um, and the best golfers in the field on bent POA greens are Robert McIntyre, Pearson Cootie, Eric Cole, Harry Hall, Minwoo Lee, Peter Malnati, Chandler Phillips, Ryan Fox, Nikolai Hoygaard, and Taylor Montgomery. If you, because bent POA is such a unique surface that it doesn't get used a whole lot, if you were to make it just bent grass greens, the top 10 shifts to be Minwoo Lee, Robert McIntyre, Harry Hall, Ben Coles, Bo Hostler, Alex Noren, Aaron Baddeley, Justin Sutt, Davis Riley, and Peter Malnati. So um, you get a pretty good picture of who's good at putting on this surface um, by, by doing it that way, in my opinion. Um, and so with the lack of data on a lot of the bent po greens, I'm going to be using both a bent and bent po in my model. Now, I also want to look at birdie or better on easy courses. So who are the guys who perform or are just able to make birdies in easy conditions? And that is Chris Goddard, Cameron Young, Michael Thorpe Bjornsson, Ricky Fowler, Nick Dunlap as the top five, Chris Kirk, Tom Kim, Akshay Bhatia, Ben Coles, and Ryan McCormick rounding out the top 10. And then par five birdie or better on easy golf courses. Actually, I don't believe I did the easy filter on this one. No, I did not. This is just top five or just par five birdie or better. Sam Stevens, Bo Hostler, Martin Trainer, Kelly Kraft, Mark Hubbard, Keith Mitchell, Bridgman, Olison, Grazerman, and Schmid is the top 10. Now, when you throw all that into a custom model, what you end up with is my number one golfer was Alex Noren, followed by Keith Mitchell, Taylor Pendrith, Tom Kim, Robert McIntyre. Those are going to be five guys who I'm all going to have a lot of exposure to 
this week, if I'm being honest. Alex Noren just seems like a top 20 lock. His all-around play in, in all four of the major strokes game categories has been really solid in 2024. He just hasn't been able to put it in for a win. Um, and against probably the weakest field he's going to see all of the – rest of the year, I would assume. Um, this would probably be as good of an opportunity for a win as ever for Alex Noren. Same deal with Keith Mitchell. Keith Mitchell's ball striking has just been absolutely incredible. He has a very similar profile to kind of when Tony Finau came here two years ago in terms of just super duper excelling in the ball striking, just needs to manage to catch fire with a putter or even just be okay with a putter. Because like, if we're being honest, if I play a guy in DFS, especially at a salary of 8,500 on DraftKings, I don't need him to win the golf tournament. I just need him to put in like a top 10 finish. And if his ball striking continues to be as sublime as it has been, even if he has a poor putting week, he still should finish in the top 10, top 15. And if he has a great putting week, he's going to win the tournament. He has the potential to boat race everybody because I think his ball striking game is pretty much the class of the field. Taylor Pendrith, I feel a pretty similar way about um, in terms of, you know, he won at a birdie fest earlier in the year at TBC Craig Ranch, also features Ben Grass Greens, also one of my comp courses. Um, he also finished T2 when Finau won here two years ago. So um, those top three checking off a lot of boxes. And then you have Tom Kim, who I believe is the best putter or best player in the field in general. Robert McIntyre, number five, who um, wrote a hot putter on bent Poe greens to win at the RBC Canadian open. That was a tournament where he did not really have his best T to green day or T to green week, I should say, but he was able to gain a ton of strokes with the putter and use that to his advantage. He could absolutely follow the same blueprint here on this one. He's capable of doing that again. Justin Lauer is number six, who rates out really well in terms of his recent form also rates out really well in terms of recent approach recent putting, um, pretty good in easy conditions. Basically, Justin Lauer is a good putter. He's one of the better putters on the PGA Tour. And so if you can just get him on the green, he's going to be pretty good. And this is a course with a high green regulation percentage that he should be able to just get it on the green and play well. So Justin Lauer, um, definitely going to be one of my favorite value plays this week. Rest of the top 10 is Aaron Rye, Nikolai Hoygaard, Davis Thompson, and Adam Svensson. Davis Thompson kind of in the same category of Keith Mitchell, where his ball striking has just been really, really good this year. Um, and I definitely like the idea of playing him at a course where if he just can make a few putts, that's all he needs to do because his ball striking game is going to carry him the rest of the way. All right, so that's just what my model looks like right now. But if you want to know what the final top 10 of the model looks like, you can get that information because I tinker with this model all week long. And what I do is every single week on the PGA Tour, as well as when Liv has an event, I post an article to my Patreon, patreon.com slash Mike's Money Picks, where I have my DFS score for DraftKings and FanDuel, as well as my final model top 10 with rationale as to why those cores are what they are, as well as the model top 10. So even if you don't play the exact players from the core, or from the model, you kind of get enough of a reasoning that you can build out your own lineups and build out your own model yourself. So um, I, I do believe that is something that can help you at patreon.com slash Mike's Money Picks. I do those for PGA Tour and Live. I've also got some best ball tools for the NFL that are on there. There's going to be more going up as the summer progresses. And then when we get the regular season, NFL, college football, and college basketball, the DFS course will be on there as well. All right, let's go ahead and end that there. Let's go ahead and take a look at the board and see if we can figure out who we need to be targeting this week in specific. So I got to be honest, this week is truly a like terrifying week to play DFS for or to bet an outright winner because truly anybody in this field can win this golf tournament. Anybody in this field can also miss the cut. And so, um, and the reason why is because like we talked about, it, it's so much of this comes down to putting where, where the TD green play is kind of de-emphasized in favor of the putting that like, you know, guy shows up, has a pretty good TD green week and, and can't buy a putt on Thursday or Friday and, and he's heading home. Um, or, you know, a guy that nobody expects anything of just starts holding every putt and now all of a sudden he's near the top of the leaderboard. Right. So um, truly anything can happen this week, especially when the field is this week. And I got to say on, on DraftKings, this might be like the most flexible salary structure that I've ever seen DraftKings have. And they've got the 5K range. So there's a ton of value. Um, even if you don't want to play a ton of those 5K guys, it's there is an option. And, and kind of there's a lot of guys in the 6K range that are very palatable that would probably be in the 7K range 
on you know a, a different week. And the max price is only eleven thousand dollars with Tom Kim. So it is actually quite easy, in my opinion, to make a lineup that you feel pretty good about, where you can get two players upwards of nine k in the lineup. If you're playing DFS this week, if you're playing a lot of lineups like I generally do, uh, two twenty maxes, um, as well as a few hand builds, um, in my ones that I do with my optimizer, my two twenty maxes, I am going to not lock anybody. I'm probably going to have a pretty low max exposure because this is truly a week where anybody can miss the cut. And that one person missing the cut can end up killing you if you end up locking somebody and they do miss the cut. So that's going to be something I'll be worried about. Also, super difficult week to try to predict an outright winner. Um, I would probably look towards the top 10, top 20 market or each way betting. Um, I'm going to mention a few guys who I think make for really good top 10 and top 20 bets. If I were to pick an outright winner, it would probably be one of these guys near the top of the board who, whose TD green game is heading in the right direction. Speaking of which, Tom Kim. He's the class of this field. He's he's one of the best approach players in the field. He's coming off of the runner-up at the Travelers, which is the same putting surface that you're going to see again this week. And he pretty much matched Scotty Scheffler T degree at the Travelers. And Scheffler just kind of outputted him by a little bit. So um, I really do think that this is a great spot for Tom Kim. I think this is a solid course fit, even though he's not super long off the tee. Any short course or course that plays short, is going to play into Tom Kim's advantage, which is his short irons and his wedge game. He hits a lot of greens with them. If you're looking to kind of poke a hole in Tom Kim's game, it's because the dude like never takes a week off. Pretty much he has not missed an event except for the Zurich since the start of April, which is kind of insane. And the Zurich was also a team event. Um, but he's played every single week since the CJ Cup by Nelson, which is just an incredible run, and he's been incredible on it. And um, I really do think that this is a pretty good spot for him. And, and Tom Kim is probably going to be in a lot of my DFS lineups this week um, and going to speak on one and done here just a little bit later. Cam Young is going to be, I believe, a pretty chalky play because of what he did with the, the 59 at the Travelers. Um, you know, he is normally a pretty poor putter, and in that round he got superbly hot with the putter. But, like – Here's the thing. I think people are going to flock to him because of that performance at the Travelers. He also owns a T2 at this course. But, like, I kind of think he left some strokes on the table at the Travelers. There's eight par fives that he played that week. Um, and for one of the longest hitters in the field who had a really good driving week, he only played the par fives at minus two in eight chances. So, like, he left some strokes out there and still finished T9. So, like, I think he's going to be chalky, but it's kind of well-deserved. I think this is the type of, type of golf course that he would win at, just a course where you can just shut your brain off, wail away with driver, hit into a green, hopefully make your birdie putt. Like, like I do think this is a pretty good spot for Cam Young. But if I had to anticipate ownership, he would probably be the most popular out of anybody. Minwoo Lee is an odd one. He's one of the longest players in the field off the tee. He is one of the field's best putters on back grass, so he has those two things going for him. However, he is generally a poor iron player. So I just don't know what to make of him. I find him to be the hardest player to predict in this top little range. Um, and so I'm probably going to be having a little bit of Minwoo Lee in DFS, but probably not betting him outright, probably not getting to him in one and done. Norton and Batia. I love this week. Um, their TD Green games are just in incredible shape right now. They're playing really good golf. And all they need is a week where they're good with the putter that they could just kind of come through, right? Um, I do think that these two guys out of anybody are probably the most likely to make the cut um, because I think their TD Green games are generally so sound that even if they come out and have two poor putting days on Thursday and Friday, they're still going to be able to make the cut. Pendrith and Jaeger, we already talked about already, are, are two of my favorite plays this week. Um, I do think that you can kind of build a lineup starting with the two of them and, and feel pretty doggone good about it with a remaining salary of $77.50. You can get really aggressive if you want to start with both of them. I think it would be pretty hard to make them your second and third guy into a DFS lineup, but it would be quite easy to play one of the top five guys and then one of them to um, as your second guy in, or to start off with just them too. I, I really do love Pendrith and Jaeger. Pendrith, Pendrith is a great course fit. He's great at birdie fest, as is Jaeger. Love both of them this week. Will Zalatoris, I don't know. Um, you know, he came out of the gates firing at the Travelers and kind of faded over the weekend. Um, I just don't think that birdie fests are the type of environment where you want to play Will at. He is a long and straight driver of the golf ball, which the straight part is not going to matter at all this week. And he's also a great long iron player, which he's not going to have in his hands at all this week. 
So um, this co this course is going to kind of emphasize the weakest parts of his game, the putter, um, and de-emphasize the strengths of his game. So I do not think that this is a great spot for Will Zalatoris. I will be super happy to see him win because I just like the guy. He's from Wake, you know, he went to college at Wake Forest, which is right down the road from me, as did Cameron Young, by the way. Um, I'd be happy to see him win, but I just – don't really think this is the week to play him. And then at $9,000, you have only the defending champion, Ricky Fowler, who just, you know, kind of has been in poor form this year, but did have a T20 in his last start at the Travelers. And the pessimist would be like, oh, well, he pretty much gained all of his strokes putting at the Travelers. But yeah, he could kind of do that again this week and still be okay, right? Because if you just kind of just plot along and make all your putts, you can win this week. And so um, I, I think that Ricky is actually a decent play at $9,000 on DraftKings. I just worry about him being a little higher owned than he should be, A, because he's the defending champ, and B, because he's Ricky Fowler. Um, so I don't really know what to make of it. I, I, like I said, I expect him to be pretty chalky. Maverick McNeely and Aaron Rye, I do like a lot for different reasons, though. Uh, Maverick McNeely, I'm gonna, and I'm going to kind of lump Robert McIntyre into this boat as well. They're good putters of the golf ball, right? And their recent form has been really good. And so those are kind of two boxes that we really want to check off this week, right? If you have a good putting week um, and you have a good tee to green week, well, then you're going to be in really good shape. And so Maverick McNeely has not been able to break through for a win on the PGA Tour, but he's been pretty good here, um, 21st and 8th in his two starts at this event, along with a missed cut when he was injured. Um, so I really do think he's in pretty good shape, as well as we already talked about Robert McIntyre. If you're looking for a guy who can spike with the putter, Bobby Mack is a guy who can do that, and he loves this type of greens. He did that exact same thing at the RBC Canadian Open on Bent Poa Greens. Um, so I do like both of them as well. And Aaron Rye is just a guy who, if you look at his stat profile, it's just a ton of green everywhere for every category, except with the putter some weeks. You never know when he's going to have a good putting week or a bad putting week, but like when he has a good one, this is a field in a tournament that he could win at. So like, I'm definitely going to be getting him in some of my lineups in DFS. I think he actually is a very sneaky outright bet this week because pretty much his TD green game is so sound that if he does in fact gain with the putter this week, he's going to be in great, great shape. All right, so the, um, with us having already talked about uh, Keith Mitchell and Davis Thompson, we're going to go ahead and end the segment right there. We're going to take a quick break, and then we're going to talk about some value plays. I would be remiss if I did not talk about some of the amateurs that are teeing it up here at the Rocket Mortgage Classic this week. First on the board on DraftKings is Michael Thor Bjornsson, who we saw last week at the Travelers Championship have a T39 finish. He was the number one golfer in the PGA Tour U standings, which meant that he kind of automatically gets his PGA Tour card for the rest of the season, kind of like Ludwig Ober did last year. Um, and so he is going to be kind of a mainstay for a while now. I think he's very talented. I think he's a little overpriced on DraftKings at $8,000 based off of what we saw last week. But, um, I mean, this is absolutely a week where you could see somebody pulling Nick Dunlap and just – get super hot with the butter and win as an amateur. It would not shock me at all if he did that. Speaking of Nick Dunlap, I actually really like him this week. Um, I think Nick Dunlap is at his best where – all the courses in front of him, and it's just very quite simple. There's not a whole lot of decision making going on. You're able to just kind of hit driver, hit whatever club to whatever distance, and putt. Um, you know, kind of like when he won at the American Express, kind of like when he was T12 at the Memorial. There's not a whole lot of thinking at either of those courses. So I don't think that this is a poor spot for Nick Dunlap at 7,400, even though he's not an amateur anymore. Luke Clinton is next up at $7,000 on DraftKings. We saw him make the cut at the U.S. Open, and he gained strokes in every category except for around the green play. And, like, it's Pinehurst, right, for an amateur. I, I can forgive a guy not – um, gaining strokes in around the green play. And, and so I really do think Luke Clinton, pretty talented, definitely worth a look at $7,000. The other amateur that made the cut at the U.S. Open was Neil Shipley. He's at $6,300 on DraftKings this week. He actually ended up being the low AM thanks to his performance on Sunday out dueling um, Luke Clinton. Um, he's made the cut at both the Masters and the U.S. Open, which a lot of PGA Tour guys can't say. He's really long off the tee. He's a good driver of the golf ball. Um, would not shock me to see him play well this week either. With these amateurs, we don't have a whole lot of data on them. But like I said, what we do know is what they did at the majors um, and how they performed at those majors. So those two guys are worth a look. There's two more that I got to talk about, though, one of which is Ben James. So he is um, a college golfer like Thor Bjornsson, but I don't think he ranked as well as Thor Bjornsson, but like he won more events 
which is like odd to think about, right? That the guy that won the most wasn't the highest ranked. But um, anyway, um, he's kind of equally on on par in terms of talent with Thor Bjornsson, but he's three thousand dollars less on DraftKings, much less proven at the PGA Tour level, though. And the last one is Miles Russell, who is like I believe he's fifteen. Maybe he's 16 by now. I don't know. Um, but he did play in two Corn Ferry Tour events, T20 and a missed cut. Um, this kid is apparently the next big thing um, to be getting in this tournament at either age 15 or 16. Like I said, I know he was 15 when he first played on the Corn Ferry Tour. I don't know if he has since turned 16. Um, so, um, yeah, that's pretty much the amateurs that we're looking at this week. And I would be willing to give all of them a shot in DFS. I think that a top 20 bet for, for one of the guys further down the board, particularly like a Ben James or a Luke Klein, I think really does appeal to me this week. I would certainly be interested in making a top 20 bet for those two guys. Now, anyway, looking at the rest of the guys that are $8,000 or below, um, buyer beware on Ben Griffin. He apparently had eye surgery um, after the RBC Canadian Open, and he hasn't been able to putt for crap since then, which was normally the strength of his game. Um, I do think the guy's going to figure it out. I hope he does because he's talented. You know, he's a guy that you can root for, but like, um, you know, that kind of just explains his recent struggles. And I'm going to kind of stay away from him until he can show me that he can, um, you know, play well in, in that environment. Um, in the 7K range, you have a ton of guys who like elevate their game in easy courses like Van Ruyen, Hubbard, and Svensson. But nobody does it quite like Taylor Moore because he is so putting dependent. His recent stat profile is so bad. Missed cut, missed cut, missed cut, T68 in a 71-player event. But Taylor Moore can get hot with the putter. And he has in two trips here at the Rocket Mortgage. He has played this event twice. He has not finished outside the top 10 in either event. That's um, it's quite noteworthy. So, but... So what I hope happens is I'm going to play a little bit of Taylor Moore, and I hope that that is still more than the rest of the field does. I hope the rest of the field absolutely stays away because of um, the guys priced around him that I already mentioned, as well as the fact that his recent form is so terrible. But I think he's worth a flyer in DFS because of his ability to be really good with the putt, which, which he's done in years past. It, it, last year at this tournament, he gained like 10 strokes putting. Matt Wallace is another one that I really like. Matt Wallace is a guy that you fire up in easy scoring conditions. You fire up in weak field events. And guess what we have this week? Easy scoring condition course in a weak field event. He was T4 at the Byron Nelson in the same type of environment. T27 at the RBC Canadian Open in a pretty similar environment. Played last week on the DP World Tour to T15 at the KLM Open. Um, Matt Wallace is a guy who can certainly win in this type of field. And I am going to be rolling him out at $7,400. You also have... Um, some bombers here in this range. If you're looking to just kind of play the, oh, Bryson, Finau have won, Matt Wolf second, Cameron Young second, Taylor Pendrith second, this course is all bombers. Well, then you have some here in this range, Hoygaard, Hostler, and Cam Davis, who, by the way, did win this event three years ago. Um, I think you can go with any of the three of them and, and feel pretty good. I think Cam Davis will be the most popular of the three of them. Now, at $7,000 on DraftKings, I believe we have a supreme misprice, and that is Daniel Berger. He is coming off of a T21 at the U.S. Open, where he was one of the best ball strikers in the field. He was also one of the best ball strikers in the field at the Charles Schwab Challenge back in May. Um, his ball striking is in really good form. And he is generally a decent putter back before his back injury. And he just kind of hasn't been great with it this season. And, you know, I kind of think that he is just kind of progressing back and back to where he was before the injury. And I really like him at the price of $7,000. If he is able to recapture that pre-injury form, um, you're certainly going to get paid off for it. Like, honestly, when DraftKings came out with the pricing, if he would have been sitting there right next to, like, Keith Mitchell and Davis Thompson in the $8,000 range, I wouldn't have batted an eye. And instead, we're getting him down here at seven thousand dollars let's take advantage of this supreme misprice now in the 6k range you do have a run of ball strikers that i really do like got her up novak phillips novak is coming off of the best ball striking tournament of his career at the rbc canadian open he just could not hold a putt chandler phillips has back-to-back -back 10th and 12th place finishes coming in and it's 
mostly due to his ball striking form. And Chris got her up one at Myrtle Beach um, back in May and has been quite poor since then. But I just don't think any of those courses particularly fit his game all that well. And they're also much stronger fields than when he won at Myrtle Beach. This is a guy who is one of the longest hitters on the PGA Tour. He's pretty accurate with the driver as well. He's just a flusher with his irons. Um, Chris got her up $6,700 as well as Novak and Phillips. I'm going to have no problem getting them into my lineups this week. We already mentioned my affinity for Justin Lauer. You also have former winner of this event, Nate Lashley at 6,500. Mac Meissner at 6,400. I don't mind as well. Great recent form coming into the U.S. Open, and he did miss the cut, but I'm not going to hold that against him. I also like Jake Knapp at this event. I kind of like Jake Knapp the same way I like um, Nick Dunlap, where this is a course where it's quite simple. Just whale driver off the tee, hit the green, hit your putt, go to the next hole. And if you look at the courses he's played well at, that's kind of been his jam, right? Eighth at the Byron Nelson, fourth at the, the Cognizant Classic, which is a little bit trickier, but that one's pretty simple. Just avoid the water and you're good. Um, and then win at Mexico, third at the Farmer's Insurance, right? Like that's just kind of his jam. So um, I don't mind rolling out Jake Knapp at $6,400. You also have at $6,400, JJ Spawn, who has played this event five times and has not missed the cut. The only man who has done that even though his recent form is quite awful coming in. If you're a believer in course history, JJ Spawn should be your guy this week. We also have some guys in the 6K range that I'm going to roll out just because they're always pretty good at easy courses. Chase, uh, Cheston Hadley, Troy Merritt, Chan Kim, got no problem playing any of the three of them at an easy golf course. Now, when you start dipping down into the 5K range, it starts getting a little bit ugly. But at $6,000 even, you got Kevin Tway, who's coming in on really good form. Um, just a, another one of the guys that's a pretty long hitter off the tee, really good ball striker, really good at easy courses. Big fan of Kevin Tway coming in this week. Um, and then you also have a few guys that – they're, they've shown in the past that they can get supremely hot with the putter. And if you're looking for long shots to bet this week, listen up. These are the guys who have the upside to win this tournament. This week, if your TD Green game is just good enough and you spike with the putter, you have the chance to win the golf tournament. And so not everybody has shown that this season, but there are a few guys in this 6K and 5K range who have done it. Ben Silverman has done it. Um, ben Coles has done it, very nearly winning at the CJ Cup Byron Nelson back in May. Pearson Cootie has done it, did it at the RBC Canadian Open. Um, and then you have, um, oh gosh, where was he? I got to find him. Hold on. Hayden Buckley. That was who I was thinking of. Um, sorry, y'all. I, I, I've lost my notes here. Um, Hayden Buckley um, did that at the Charles Schwab Challenge, gained about six strokes with the putter. Um, and so he's another guy who could do that as a super long shot. You also have your guys in this range who are just bombers. Nick Hardy, Gary Kigo, Alejandro Tosti, fire away. You also have the, your guys in this range that the strength of their game is their approach. Sam Ryder. Um, Kelly Kraft, Stuart Sink, um, wouldn't mind playing any of those, but like really with the nature of this tournament being what it is, even though some of these plays in the 5k are pretty ugly, some of these guys are going to make the cut. Some of these guys are going to be near the top of the leaderboard. So if you're willing to take shots on a few of them, just kind of grasping at straws and trying to find one or two reasons to take a shot at them. That's all you really need this week. All right, let's go ahead and take a quick breather. And then we're going to break down one and done for this week. So if you have been watching me all season long, you've heard me talk about one and done that for some of these guys in this field, there's going to be an event in the summer where they're one of the favorites in the field. And that is going to be the week where you want to pick them. Well, guess what? We've arrived to the week in the summer where some of these guys are the favorites and you absolutely have free reign to pick them this week. And really a lot of these guys you can pick with no remorse because you're not going to want them later on down the road. The only guy in this field that I would probably reserve for later. Actually, there's, there's two. Tom Kim, I think, is a great pick at Wyndham. Um, you know, he's won that event before. He's still playing good golf. Um, he's probably not going to be on his streak of like 10 tournaments in a row by the time you get to Wyndham. Um, so you might get him a little bit more rested. If he hasn't won yet by Wyndham, that's a tournament that he could very well win. I, I would not have any quarrels with you if you were saving Tom Kim for Wyndham. But we're also late enough in the season that you should be planning out who you're going to play where. So, like, if you still have Sung Jay left, um, Sung Jay is probably going to play Wyndham. Um, if, if you feel like you're going to need Tom Kim for the Wyndham, save him for that. But if not, I have no problem rolling him out this week. Will Zalatoris, I would probably save for another event. I just don't think that this course is a very good fit for him. Um, and I would be totally good to pass on him and wait till he shows form. Or, um, 
you know, if, if playing it, of course, it's a better fit for him. And then, you know, I did mention that those are the only two that I would consider saving. I think you can make an argument that, especially if you need guys, Robert McIntyre at the Open Championship or at the Scottish Open would be a really solid play. I would have no problem playing him at one of those two events if, if you're really running low on guys. But other than that, like this is a week where it's like bombs away. Like play whatever guy you think has the best chance at winning. If, if you're near the front, the chalky one and done pick this week is going to be Cameron Young because he's been pretty bad all season. He is one of the betting favorites, and he's now coming in with a little bit of form at a course where he has played and finished as the runner-up. He's going to be the popular one and done pick. So if you're near the top, Click Cam Young, feel good about it. Hopefully he does well. If you're looking to make up ground, I feel like you can play any of the other guys. I think Tom Kim is going to be decently highly owned, but I do think there are um, other enough other options as well that you don't have to worry too much about that. Like I really do like Akshay this week. Akshay is definitely a guy that I knew was going to be one of the near favorites in the summer months at a field like this. Um, and so I think this is a really good spot for Akshay. Um, I think this is a really good spot for Steven Yeager as well. If you still have him left, um, Ricky Fowler, the defending champ, have no problems playing him either. Um, and then if you want to go, like if you're losing and you're one and done and you need to gain ground, Roll with a guy like a Jake Knapp or an Aaron Rye or a Maverick McNeely or a Davis Thompson or a Keith Mitchell. Like, there's so many options this week that you can go with that, like, really, you just don't have, you're not going to have any props with. Pick the guy that you feel the best about, but also play your position. So, if, you, if you're trying to gain ground, playing Cameron Young or Tom Kim is probably not going to gain you a whole lot of ground this week. So, um, I am going to go with Akshay Patia and the one that I've been picking here on the show. I've been um, playing this one pretty aggressively. I, I, I feel pretty good about picking him at this event, though, and not missing out on him at any of the others. Um, I was getting closer and closer to the money. I had Xander in this one last week, um, and that one kind of hurt me a little bit. I had Scheffler at the U.S. Open, which killed me the fact that I used Scotty at that tournament. Um, but anyway, um, we're, we're looking to bounce back with Akshay this week. All right, but that is going to do it for um, the 2024 Rocket Mortgage Preview. If you like what you saw here on the video on YouTube, please hit the like button. It helps me out a ton, and I really do appreciate it. If you're listening on audio, please rate and review the podcast. I really do appreciate it when you guys do that. And, and most importantly, spread the word out. Tell a friend. If you, if you have anybody else you know who um, plays DFS, bets on golf, plays one and done, you know, send this to them. Let them know that, um, you know, you enjoy it um, and let them know that I also do content for college football, college basketball, and NFL as well. Um, and we're doing a lot of best ball stuff over the rest of the summer, but we're, we're trying to bit by bit grow the community. And that can only happen if you guys do help me out as well. So I really, really do appreciate it when you guys do. Um, but other than that, that is going to end it for this week, y'all. So um, whether you are playing one and done DFS betting, hopefully we gave you guys plenty of information that you need in order to pick the winners here this week at the Rocket Mortgage. Best of luck to you this week in whatever game you guys are playing. Thank you guys for watching and listening to this point, and I will see you guys next.